What up, gang? This is Ken Zerk, Ken Zilling, is Ezekiel Milligan, the villain from the trailer, and we are back on Fate Stay Night. It feels good to finally have a main menu. Y'all don't understand. I f oh, man, it feels good to have a main menu. Go ahead, press new game. Okay, I did, I did it right. I am the bone of my sword. Steel is my body and fire is my blood. I created over a thousand blades, unknown to death nor known to life have withstood pain to create many weapons yet those hands will never hold anything so i pray unlimited blade works when i came to i was lying in a burning field it must have been a big fire the familiar town was an unrecognizable smoking ruin. It looked like a scene from a war movie. The sight didn't last long though. As morning dawned, the fires gradually died down. The towering walls of flame shrunk to embers, and most of the buildings looked to have collapsed. It felt so strange, being the only unchanged thing in the town. I was the only one left alive. I was either, I was either fortunate or the house I'd been inside was built on the luckiest ground of all time. Either way, I was the only one alive. Since I'd survived, I felt I needed to keep on living. I walked aimlessly, thinking it would be dangerous to remain where I was. It wasn't that I wanted to avoid becoming what had happened to everyone around me, those scorched, blackened masses. It wasn't a feeling of disgust. Some other emotion was driving me on. At the same time, I had no hope. It was a miracle I was alive at all, and I didn't think I was going to last much longer. There's just no way in hell I was going to survive. There's simply no way I would ever escape this crimson hellscape, no matter what I did. That was how desperate, how hellish this place was, even through the eyes of a young boy. And then I collapsed. There was no air around me, or I simply couldn't breathe anymore. I just collapsed, and all I could do was look up at the slowly clouding sky. The scorched black masses around me lay motionless. The dark clouds covered the sky, promising rain. Good. The rain will put out these fires. I took one final deep breath and looked up at the rain clouds. I couldn't breathe, but I still felt pain. I said that out loud on behalf of all those people who couldn't say those words themselves. Wowza. That was 10 years ago. Miraculously, in the midst of all of that, I was saved. My physical body survived. But everything else was scorched, reduced to ash. When a young child loses their parents or their home, there's really nothing left for them. And so everything other than my body perished, put as simply as possible, in exchange for my body living, my heart died. I'm dreaming. I squinted, seeing a bright white light. It was blinding. Light stabbed in my eyes when I woke. I doubt I really knew what the sensation of blinding light was in the first place. Huh? What? As my eyes adjusted, I woke, alarmed. I was lying in a bed I didn't recognize, in a room that I didn't recognize. I was honestly stunned, but the cleanliness of the white room made me feel at ease. Where am I? I looked blankly at my surroundings. The room was spacious and the beds lined in neat rows. All the beds were full and looked like each other's, each bed's occupant was injured. But the room didn't feel depressing at all. Everyone injured survived. I let my eyes wander. I looked out the window. The clear blue sky was so incredibly beautiful. A few days passed and I was finally able to take in the situation. I had no problem remembering what happened the days before, but I wasn't much different from a newborn during this time. 
Strange as it is, I was closer to the truth than might seem possible. The fire was just that bad. I was rescued from the fire. I awoke in a hospital. My pants were gone and my entire body was wrapped in bandages. I didn't really understand what was going on, but I didn't know that I was alone. It didn't take long for me to accept my circumstances. Maybe I had no choice. Really, all the other children were in the same boat. And then later, in the moment I, naive as I was, started to worry about what would become of me, he walked in. He appeared the day my bandages came off and started eating, and I started eating at my own. His hair was disheveled, his suit tattered. He looked a bit younger than my doctor. He looked more like someone's older brother than someone's father. Hello, you must be Shiro. His beaming smile seemed to blend into the pouring white sunlight. His voice was somehow irritatingly fake, yet extremely gentle. I'll come right to it. Would you rather go to an orphanage or go with the man you just met? He was offering to take me in. I asked if we were related. He said we were complete strangers. He looked like an unremarkable, unreliable guy. But then again, he was no more or less familiar than the orphanage. I decided I'd go with him. Oh good. Then let's pack up quickly. It'd be best if you got used to your new home as soon as possible. He started gathering my things hastily. Even as young as I was, I could see he wasn't any good at it. And after he made a mess packing, I forgot to mention one important thing. Before you come with me, there's one thing you need to know. He turned, asking for confirmation. He asked so casually, as if asking me if, I, if there was somewhere I wanted to go. Yep. Let me be direct with you. I'm a magician. He said it in a serious, almost ceremonious manner. It happened so fast. Now that I think back, I was also immature. I just accepted his words as fact. I took it neither as a joke or a genuine statement. Really? That's cool, Pops. I guess I said something like that. Eyes wide in astonishment. I want to see my boy though. Like, let me see him. I want to see my boy. I, I recognize his voice. I know who that is. And I was his child. Actually, I don't remember how the conversation went. But every now and then, my old man would bring it up. He would recount that scene over and over, acting all embarrassed. That scene might have been the happiest day of my old man. A man named Kiritsugu Emiya's life. You can say that... It was one thing for him to tell a recently orphaned kid he was a magician, but I was no better the way I so eagerly bought into it. And that's how my old man adopted me and how I took the last name Emiya, Shiro Emiya. When I say that name out loud, I felt really proud of having the same last name as Kiritsugu. I'm dreaming. It's from my childhood. It's probably about eight years ago. This is about the time when I talked my old man into making me his apprentice. Kiritsugu had started going away on a regular basis once I was old enough to stay home by myself. He'd always give some childish, unbelievable explanation like, I'm going on an adventure around the world. Then he'd actually do it. From then on, that's how it always was. It wasn't unusual for him to be gone for a month. And at times, he didn't come home for almost half a year. The Emiya Mansion is an expansive Japanese samurai-style house, and Kiritsugu and I were the only ones living there. It felt too big and empty for a child like me, and at times I felt lost. But I liked my life there. Whenever Kiritsugu came home from his trips, he would brag and tell stories like an excited child. And another child, one who shared his last name, always looked forward to those stories. I may have been alone in the mansion, but Kiritsugu's stories always helped lessen that. He was always pursuing a dream like a boy. I was weary of his whims, yet at the same time he always looked radiant to me. Maybe that's why I hoped to be like him one day. Well, as, a, as, as childish as I might have been, I realized I needed to get my act together since I had an old man with his head constantly in the clouds.
Okay, so are we on the faint route? I hear a sound. The heavy, rusted hinges on the door creak as it's being pushed open. Light pours through the crack in the door. My mind tries to shake off the slumber. Senpai, are you awake? I hear footsteps drawing near, and I feel the winter air flowing in. Mm, morning, Sakura. Yes, good morning to you too. It's morning. It's still early, but Miss Fujimura will be mad if she finds you sleeping here. Oh, yeah. Thanks for waking me up as always. It's no problem at all. You're always up early in the morning. I don't often get to wake you up like this. I'm not sure why, but Sakura looks more cheerful than usual. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I think you wake me up more often than you think. Then again, Fujine is brutal when she's the one waking me up, so I prefer you to do it. Yep, I've learned my lesson. I'll try not to sleep in here next time. I answer, still half asleep. My head's still not right, so I, even I don't know what I'm saying. Well, okay. But personally, I prefer you not to try too hard. Sakura is giggling. Crap, I must still be so sleepy. I've said something weird. Uh, give me a minute to wake up. The cold winter air helps at times like this. The chill snaps my lethargic mind awake. And in front of me stands my junior at school, Sakura Mata. And I'm in my house's storehouse. And it's just about six o'clock in the morning. Senpai. Yeah, I'm awake now. Sorry, Sakura, I did it again. I need to help you with breakfast. Don't worry about that. You were up late again last night, weren't you? Then you should take your time this morning. I'll fix breakfast. She's such a sweetheart. Sakura is practically bouncing with excitement. That's odd. Sakura is weirdly energetic this morning. No, no, I'm getting up, honest. So let's head to the kitchen together. He's a sweetheart too. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go, Sakura. Um, well, senpai. Uh, something to matter? No, not exactly, but... Um, I believe you should change before you head back inside the house. Bro in his drawers. Oh shit, hold on, my dick out, my fault. I finally look at myself. I fell asleep working last night, so I'm still wearing my coveralls. The coveralls I wear when I'm working are usually dirty. Who knows what Fujine would say or do if I went to the house as is. Okay, I, I guess I'm not quite awake yet. I must be more out of it than usual. You might be right. Which is why you should leave breakfast to me. And you should take it easy, senpai. Besides, Miss Fujimura would be really angry if she saw the mess here. How the fuck are you making noise outside while I'm recording? I should better not pick up on my microphone. I'm finna air this bitch out. Yeah, then I'll get changed. So you go on ahead. Okay, I'll be waiting, senpai. What a sweetheart. Sakura quickly walks out. Okay then, I'm changing into my school uniform first, then I need to collect all the parts I left scattered around. The storehouse is in the, cor in the corner of the backyard. All sorts of junk is crammed in here. Though I've always liked to tinker with gadgets, so the place is a treasure trove for me. The old man forbade me to go into the storehouse, but I ignored his warnings and snuck inside almost every day. Now it's sort of like a base for me. I guess you could call this place my real room. The massive Emiya house never felt homey to me, but I've always felt at ease in here, surrounded by all this junk. Besides, it's wasteful. It may be junk, but a lot of it still works. A majority of the things in the storehouse are everyday things, mostly unusable. I'm not sure whether I brought it all in because I liked it in here, or whether I liked this place because it was full of junk. Either way, I snuck into the storehouse almost daily. I made sort of a hobby of fixing broken things. 
I'm not the type to get attached to things, but it just didn't feel right to neglect things that are still usable. Or maybe it would be better to say the idea of doing that just bothered me. Oh, what? Which is why I stayed up all night trying to fix a broken stove. I guess I'll be done tomorrow. Falling asleep midway is proof I'm not concentrating. I tried to shake off that self-disgust at that. I gathered the parts for the stove and put them back on the shelf of things waiting to get fixed. There's no more room though. Once I fix the stove and old VCR is up next. Both of them were destroyed by Fujine. We can set that aside for now. Okay then. I change into my school uniform. Since the storehouse is like my own room, I have all the essentials, including changes of clothes in here. The rest are things like haphazardly drawn blueprints scattered all over the place and literal junk from my failed attempts at fixing various things. There's also some sort of pattern carved into the storehouse's floor, perhaps used as some sort of altar in the past. I think I know what that might be. I think I know why he said not to go in the storehouse. Okay, gotta work hard again today. I clap my hands in prayer at the storehouse and turn towards the mansion. I walk from the storehouse to the mansion. The Emiya residence is a Japanese... The Emiya residence is a Japanese samurai style house located on the outskirts of town. My old man wasn't from a notable family, yet for some reason he owned this giant house. That in itself was a mystery, and it also seemed he didn't have any relatives here in Japan. And so when my old man died, there was no one else to inherit this mansion, so it came to me as his adopted son. Though to be honest, I don't have any administrative abilities, so things like inheritance, property tax, uh, and other complicated things are all handled by old man Fujimura. Old man Fujimura is a major businessman who lives nearby. Kiritsuka described old man Fujimura as an old man who's like a Yakuza boss. Obviously that was his own biased view. In fact, old man Fujimura is not like a Yakuza boss. He is a Yakuza boss. That may be a problem in itself, but I try not to dwell on it. Anyway, that's why I live in this giant mansion on my own. It's been five years since my old man died. Time sure does fly. I sighed thinking about how much I've grown in these five years. I trained every day to become like Kiritsugu, but that's easier said than done. It's not surprising since I didn't have what it takes from the start, but the fact that I haven't improved at all in these five years forces me to reassess things. If I had to sum up my current situation, I'd say I set the bar too high. I haven't even reached the starting line. Rushing it won't do me any good. For now, I just have to do what I can. Okay then. What I need to do now is... Oh shit, I got options. Wait, I knew I had... I, I, I knew I was gonna have options. What the fuck? What should I do? I'm gonna save. Somebody... Yeah, I know. Visual novels, you gotta like... Literally save at every turn. What I need to do now is... I can go help Sakura, but like... We have daily tasks. We gotta... We gotta take care of our shit. Sakura is a sweetheart. I do wish I could help her though. There's a respectable dojo built within the Emiya house. It was added as an afterthought when the entire house was being built. It was nothing more than a hobby and indulgence. Okay then. I do some light exercise before breakfast. I'm not really studying martial arts. My old man once told me, if you wanna be like me, you'll need to harden your body. Since then, I made a point of working out almost every day. 99, 100. Finish my daily set. Oh, he better than me. I could not do an, I could not do 100 sit-ups. I killed myself before I did 100 sit-ups. I finished my daily sit-ups and changed from my dogi into my school uniform. You're not gonna, you're not gonna shower, you sweaty bitch. Since I overslept, I decided to, I decided to work out just enough to satisfy me. A few setups with no stretching should be enough. I'm not built to bulk up, and no matter how important I say bodybuilding is, not like I want to get into fights. All I need to do is gain enough athletic ability to handle unexpected situations, be able to move the way my silly ideals require. After all, the thing I want most is to be the complete opposite of an athlete. What did he say? 
I want to be the complete opposite of an athlete. I don't understand that. Oh, it's getting late. I tossed my sweaty doggy in the laundry hamper. It's already 20 past six. Give me a household's morning start early. Even this time would be considered late for breakfast. Breakfast is already prepared. The appetizing scent of the breakfast Sakura cook wafts towards me from the dining table. You must have had a good workout. Breakfast is ready. Oh, thanks. Sorry, I made you work more because I overslept. It's no trouble. And you didn't oversleep. You're not in any school club, so it's still early. Clubs have nothing to do with it. And if they do, you coming by in the morning must be a lot of trouble since you do have morning practice. Oh, well, I want to do this, so please don't worry about me. Yeah, you keep telling me that, which is why I wake up early, club or no. If you're coming by, it'd be rude to still be asleep. To me, waking up early is waking up before Sakura gets here. And oversleeping means I make Sakura prepare breakfast on her own like today. You really are a stickler about this kind of thing. Even Michizuri Senpai says you're honest to a fault and annoying, even though you're so crude. Michizuri is the captain of the Kudo club Sakura is in, and she and I seem to cross paths often. Is she still scriping about me to you? Yes, she's working hard every day to bring you to your knees with her archery skills before you graduate. Is that so? She must, been better, she must be better than me by now. You know how memories get glorified? I don't mind the reverence, but I guess that depends on who sees me that way too. Misuzuri Senpai is really competitive. I'm sure she sees you as competition. Sakura scoops rice into a bowl as she talks. It's almost 6.30. The Kyudo Club's morning practice starts at 7. Attendance is not mandatory, but she doesn't have much time left. Fujine should be here soon. Well, it's her fault for not being here on time. Sakura, let's go ahead and start eating. You're right. Here you go, senpai. Sakura hands me a rice bowl with a smile. Oops. I should be used to this every morning, but her delicate fingers catch my attention. I can't explain it, but it's awkward. I'm not sure if it's our age, but Sakura's been looking more provocative lately. Hold on, this nigga hard! Hold on. I don't know if it's our age, but Sakura's been looking more provocative lately. Her casual movements are so pretty. She often takes my breath away. Maybe it's because I never saw Sakura that way before, but now I'm noticing how feminine she's becoming. Is something the matter? No, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. Honestly, it's baffling. Why the hell am I getting so nervous around my friend's younger sister? Sakura's just really good and considerate younger friend of mine. She's someone I need to look after. She's the younger sister of a friend of mine. We used to be friendly, though initially we weren't very close since she's a grade below me. It was only a year and a half ago that our relationship became more than what it is now. Sakura started to come and cook meals for me when I got hurt and things kind of stayed like that. I think this arrangement was supposed to last until I got better, but I guess something or something or other ha something or other happened, and somehow she ended up helping out with the household chores. Either way, Sakura is a good cook, and her cleaning and laundry skills are perfect. Having her come early in the morning is a big help. It's been disconcerting recently. Sakura isn't the problem; it's me. I'm sure being flustered by my friend's younger by my friend's sister is part of the reason I feel guilty. Usually I'm unfazed, but when I blush, but when I blush because I get caught off guard like now, I wonder I, I wonder whether that's problematic as a senpai. Breakfast is lined up neatly on the table. A perfectly balanced meal of chicken with parsley salad, grilled salmon, blanched spinach. Miso soup with radish and carrots and grated yam soup. Who the fuck is cooking all this shit in the morning? Who the fuck is cooking all this shit in the morning? Just get some eggs and grits. Holy fuck. 
Thank you for the meal. Sakura and I sit down and bow and begin our meal in silence. The gentle tapping of chopsticks is the only sound in the room. Sakura isn't typically talkative. I don't hardly have anything to talk about during meals, so we eat in silence. Normally it's much rowdier than this, but the person who usually causes the commotion must have watched a spy movie or something last night because she's eyeing the two of us through a newspaper she propped up in front of her food. Miss Fujimura, it may not be wise to read while you eat. Sakura remarks diff diff diffidently, but Fujine ignores her. Fujine is acting weird, but her being weird at breakfast isn't really all that weird. Sakura is used to it too, and she's eating as if nothing's the matter. Sakura typically cooks up Western dishes. She really only began learning how to cook Japanese dishes since she started coming here to help out. Sakura learned to cook simple Japanese dishes, at least for breakfast, because Fujine and I prefer them. Now Sakura's cooking skills have improved to the point she's better than me, and I'm the one who was teaching her. Her miso soup is flavorful and refined now. She's even gotten to the point where she can grate yams and to make yam soup. Actually, I think today's the first time she served yam soup. Sorry Sakura, can you pass the soy sauce? Who is on my phone? Sorry Sakura, could you pass the soy sauce? Here. Oh, senpai. You've run out of the soy sauce you usually use. Then I can use Fujine's. Pass it over. Miss Fujimura, do you mind? Fujine nods. The newspaper shuffles. What the fuck is her issue? <laughs> Here you go. Are you going to use it for your yam soup? Yeah, everyone puts soy sauce on grated yams. A line of soy sauce streams from the bottle onto the grated white mound. I stir the mixture up, pour it over my rice, and take a bite. Mmm. The stickiness of the grated yam combined with the intense flavor of the soy sauce. Bro, what the fuck? This ain't soy sauce, it's oyster sauce. What the fuck? You motherfucker! Back your ass up! Fujine tossed her newspaper onto the table with an enthusiastic flick of her wrist. What you think of my little stunt switching the oyster sauce and soy sauce labels first thing in the morning? Bitch ass nigga, I caught your ass! The not so mysterious spy punches the air in victory. Who the fuck pulls a stunt like that in the morning? You gonna turn 25 this year, but you still the same childish I've always known. <laughs> That'll teach you a lesson after yesterday. You and everyone else who ganged up on me deserves divine justice. God, strike this nigga down. People can't enact divine justice. I knew you were weirdly quiet. Can't believe you've been plotting this since yesterday. You have entirely too much free time on your hands. How the fuck you... How you got all this free time on a teacher's salary? That's right. And because of that, I really need to get the work grading test. So I need to skedaddle or else I'm in real trouble. Bye-bye! Fujine sits back down and shuffles her breakfast into her mouth. Thanks for the meal! Breakfast was great as usual, Sakura! Oh, it was my pleasure. And now I'm heading off. You two will be trouble if you're late for school. And off she goes, stomping out in a rush. There's something terribly wrong with the world that allows someone like her to be a teacher. Damn, that's harsh. Sorry that Fujine hardly savored the breakfast you took so much work into making. No, it's not that. Um, what did you do to Miss Fujimura yesterday? She wouldn't usually go as far as to mess with someone's meal. Oh, well, I accidentally called her by her nickname. Well, I guess there's no avoiding her getting angry again. And you didn't apologize? Sorry, I forgot. But only because that kind of stuff happens all the time. Still not good. You know how much Miss Fujimura hates being called by her nickname. You made her cry again, didn't you? 
Not only did I make her cry, she also ran away like a scared rabbit. And thanks to that incident yesterday, the English class ended up being a study hall. In fact, everyone in class worked together to make an award for me from their notebook paper because of that. I threw it away, obviously. Damn, that's fucked up. Apologize. Shiro, don't be a bitch. Oh my, sounds like you brought that on yourself, senpai. Fujine's like an older sister to Sakura, so she's typically on Fujine's side, which is fine on its own. But I wish she considered the fact that I have to deal with that motherfucker all day long. Fujine was originally an acquaintance of my old man, so she swung by the house pretty frequently since I was adopted. She kept on coming over even after my old man died, and now she acts like a freeloader eating breakfast and dinner every day. That's how she has free time as a um as a, on a teacher's salary. It might have been thanks to Fujine that I was able to make it on my own after my old man died. And now it's me, Fujine, and Sakura, who are the residents of this Emiya house. But at the same time, I'm the only one who knows my old man was a mage. They say mages have to keep that part of their lives secret, which is why I've also been hiding from others that I'm learning magecraft after becoming my old man's apprentice. Learning may be a bit of a stretch, really, since I can barely use magecraft properly. So it wouldn't make much of a difference whether I hide it or not. But since it was my old man's dying wish, I've been training in secret. I finished breakfast and get ready for school. I put away the dishes with Sakura and listened to the news on the TV in the background. Sakura is looking blankly at the TV. A flashy caption reads, Gas leaks continue, pops up on the screen. There seems to have been a big accident in the neighboring city of Shinto. It happened in a building in the business district. Apparently, everyone on one of the floors lost consciousness from oxygen deprivation. Authorities have been calling it an accident resulting from gas leaks, but for some reason, these incidents have been happening often. Are you worried about the incident, Sakura? Well, not really. I was just thinking that this happened in Shinto, which is very close to us. Senpai, your part-time job is in Shinto, right? Yeah, but the shop's not that- fuck you. Yeah, but the shop's not that big. I don't think an accident like that would happen there. But I can't entirely ignore the idea either. Gas leaks can happen in any building. And it especially pains me to think that hundreds of people have fallen victim. Some say these accidents are happening because of faulty construction work done during the rapid development projects in Shinto. Either way, I hope there won't be any more victims. It's a disturbing story. We need to be careful, too. Well, don't worry about that, senpai. I always make sure that... I, I always make sure to check that the gas is turned off properly. Twice. That's smart. I always do that same shit. Before I go to bed, I always check the stove. And I always check the stove in the, um... The stove in the oven. Sakura proudly proclaims. No, that's not my point. I've already known. I always know Sakura is a little off. She's a she's a little stupid. She's just a little dumb. Senpai, did you lock the back door? I bolted it. Is that a problem? Not at all. Then I lock all the doors. What time are you planning to be home today? I think I'll be home a little late. What about you, Sakura? I should be back at the usual time. I think I'll be back before you, so I'll make preparations for dinner. Yeah, that'll be great. I'll try to come home as soon as possible, too. The gate is locked tight. Sakura and Fujine both have keys to the house, and the rule is that whoever leaves last is in charge of locking everything up. Let's go, you'll be late for morning practice if you don't hurry. Okay, then let's hurry then, senpai. Sakura and I walk into town. We walk downhill along a long wall to reach a more populate, populated residential area. The Emiya house is located on top of a hill, away from the center of town. Heading down the hill leads us to the res residential area. Going further down, we reach the intersection at the center of town. Several roads lead out to the center of town. There's a large bridge that connects to the neighboring town. 
A hill that leads to Rio del Temple. A residential area located opposite of my house. That's where um, Tosaka stays. A shopping district that both Sakura and I often go to. And finally, there's a path that leads to our school. We head straight to school without taking any detours. It's barely seven o'clock, so there's hardly anyone around. Soon as making their way to their morning club activities are the only ones to be found along, along our route. See you later. Good luck at practice. I see Sakura off at the school gate as usual. Sakura's in a Kyoto club, so this is where we usually split off. And yet, Sakura doesn't budge this morning. Sakura, are you not feeling well or something? No, it's not that. Senpai, maybe it's time you come visit the dojo? Well, I don't really have any business at the dojo. Besides, Issei asked me to do something, so I need to go to the student council room. I suppose you're right. I'm sorry for bringing it up. Sakura quickly bows her head. I'll be going then. Please look forward to dinner tonight. Sakura runs towards the dojo, seeming almost apologetic. What was that? Wonder what that was all about. Shoot that arrow. Issei, are you in? I'm here. You're a little late this morning, Emiya. Issei glances from his desk like he's studying some papers. Is it just you, Issei? Where's the rest? They should all be at school by now. Well, unfortunately, the rest of the members are all very on the clock. So y'all have their set out work hours and they don't want to come in early or stay late. So that's why the student council president is doing busy work himself. Guess you've got your own problems to deal with. Well, I live for these sort of problems. I don't need your sympathy, Emiya. What are you talking about? I'm not sympathizing with you. I don't give a fuck about you. Well, that's too bad. I'm gonna pretend I didn't hear that. After all, the fact of the matter is that you still give a fuck about me. Issei, who's gathering his papers into a single sheaf and tapping the edge against the table to square them neatly, he's the big boss of the student council. He's been working to reform the student council, which has grown quite lax. He's been a friend of mine since our first year in school. His full name is Issei Ryuta. Despite his old-fashioned sounding name, he has elegant facial features and he's popular with the girls. He's also a student council president, so you'd think he would have a leg up over everyone else, but that's not exactly the case. Nothing beats a scalding hot cup of coffee in the morning. He's saying stuff like that as he sips tea that prevents it from quite sticking the landing. As evidence, to Issei is quite plain. He's prone to be misunderstood. Yet he neither dabbles in relationships, nor he does what typical students do for fun. He's the heir of the Ryudo Temple, which sits atop a mountain. He himself understands that he will inherit the temple. And there's a strong possibility that he'll shave his head without so much of a complaint as soon as he graduates from school. So what do you want me to do today? Oh, well, I'd like you to sit down and relax. But we don't really, we really don't have time to explain. I'll explain as we go. Grab your tools and follow me. Shut up, nigga. Let me get right to the point. Our school spending habits are quite extreme. I know. The athletic clubs are favored and there's not much money to go to other, around other places. Exactly. As a result, the culture clubs get the short end of the stick. I've been trying my best to establish a better budget for the arts, but the money trail has been pretty muddy which is making my life harder, so the arts are suffering. The lack of heaters during the winter is especially concerning, and I have no solution for that. I see. Hey, hand me the flathead screwdriver, the biggest one. Give me some conductors, too. This one looks salvageable. Conductors, uh, these? Sorry, I don't really know my way around tools. You can get mad if I'm wrong. It's fine, you got it right. So what about the lack of heaters? Is there anything else that's broken? 
going on with that? Yes, yeah, the heating system in the second audio-visual room in the art club room might be on its last leg. Bones requesting to purchase the new ones are piling up by the minute. And you're saying there's no room in the budget. Well, this one's just corroded. Good thing the inside's still intact. Oh, is that one salvageable, Emiya? Yeah, I can fix it. It's a good thing old machines are easy to figure out. The wires just burned out, so as long as those get replaced, this should last until the end of the year. Is that so? Way to go, Emiya. I'm glad you're so reliable and helpful. You say some weird shit, you say. Oh, hey, I'm almost done, so get the fuck out of here. Got it, I won't get in your way. He said quietly steps out of the classroom. He might be thinking that I'm going to start on some sensitive work. Well, I guess you can call it sensitive work. I put my hand to the electric stove. No matter how long someone's been fixing things, they can't usually figure out what's wrong by sight. So the fact that I can means what I'm doing is not ordinary. I close my eyes and look inside the stove by touch, always using magic. And then, or elementals or whatever, whatever the hell they called it. And then suddenly, a single image pops into my head. There are two places where the wire is about to break. The electrical pipe should last a bit longer. The power cord should be fine with just insulation tape. Good, I should be able to fix it with just the tools I brought along. If the electrical pipes were broken, it wouldn't be fixable by an amateur. Had that been the case, a certain strengthening would have to have been done, with no amateur, which no amateur could manage. But I should be able to fix what this fix this one by sight. This is a mage crab Kiritsugu taught me. Okay, let's begin. I take off the cover to begin my repairs. I already know where it's broken, so the rest of the work is easy. Uh, this is the one thing I'm good at. That's right, I, Shiro Emiya, have absolutely no talent in Magecraft. But for some reason, I have a knack for visualizing the structure of things, or blueprints, like I just did now. My old man once saw me imagine and recreate a blueprint. He looked surprised and muttered, What a useless fucking talent. My special talent appears to be pointless. According to my own man, my old man, the fact that I can visualize object structures isn't really helpful. A mage normally wouldn't need to survey an object's entire structure like I do. He claims the major struggle is to instantly seek out the object's center, or its core, and transform it as quickly as possible. That's why blueprints are a waste of time. Even that only helps seek out areas for magical energy to pass through. And so, fixing broken stuff is one of the only things I'm good at. After all, I don't have to open the entire thing up to find the problem. If I can find the problem quickly, I can fix most things as long as I have the know-how to repair it. Though, I only do that with things an amateur could reasonably be expected to fix. Okay, Don, what's next? Put away the conductors, pick up the screwdriver, and wrench ahead out to the hallway. Oh, is this where we run into Tosaka? Issei, repairs are done. Need a water. I'm gonna be real. Y'all almost didn't get an episode today. Because I stayed up late last night watching Lane. And I was like, I was like, bro, this morning I ate some cereal. I was legit debating, like, should I record and give these people a video? Or should I just say, like, fuck my fans and binge the rest of Lane? <laughs> but I was like, you know what? I... I I can't fuck my fans, you know. I'm not Drake. I'm not fucking fans. I'll give y'all um I'll, I'll give y'all a what you call. I'll give y'all some videos. Issei, repairs are done. Oh hey. A female student is standing next to Issei in the hallway. She's fitted the fuck up. That's hard. I like that. I'm a little surprised. The girl talking to Issei is Rin Tosaka, a second year from class A. She lives in a giant western style mansion up on a big hill. She's an extraordinary honor student. She's pretty, smart, athletic, no flaws at all. She's intelligent and polite, never brags about her looks. She's truly the ideal girl to guys apparently. Which is why the male students treat her like an idol. But Tosaka's just too good and she's become unattainable. The guys all say the only people who talk to Tosaka are Issei and the teachers. 
well, okay, I'm also a guy, and I'm including myself in a, it, and I'm including myself in the list of her admirers. Tosaka's so looking at us annoyed. I guess rumors are true that Issei and Tosaka don't get along. Oh, sorry. I was the one who asked you for a favor and made you do all the work. Forgive me. Whoa. Issei's pretty gutsy talking to me and completely ignoring Tosaka like that. Don't worry about it. So what's next? There's not much time left. Yeah, next is the audio visual room. I hear it's been on its last leg for a while, but apparently it's finally given out. If it's dead, I won't be able to fix it. It might be better to buy a new one. That might be true. But I'd appreciate it if you look at it anyway. I'm, I'm, I might think it's dead, but it might just be playing dead on you. You think so? Then let me take a look. It's only about 30 minutes until homeroom starts. I'll need to hurry and fix it or I'll run out of time. I head to the audio-visual room, but I realized completely ignoring Tosaka would be rude. I turn to face her since she's been standing there the whole time. You're here early, Tosaka. I blurt out the first thing I come to mind and then follow Issei. You made it just in time. Sorry for all the trouble, Emiya. I'm a bad friend for asking a favor for you, asking a favor from you and making you late for class. Don't sweat it. It won't be a problem if I'm late, or it might be an issue if you are late. That's true, but I'm glad we made it. Issei hails a sigh of relief and heads to his desk. It's exactly 8 o'clock, five minutes after the bell for home room rings. Fujinewa into entered the classroom. My breathing is labored since I ran from the audiovisual room. I take a deep breath before I take my seat. Who the fuck is this? My controller just died. Yo, on some real shit. This nigga ugly as fuck. I think this is this is Mato, I guess. Uh, I don't see what people how he's popular. The ugliest shit. What's with all the commotion so early in the morning, Emiya? Didn't realize you became Ryudo's whipping boy after you quit our club. Not that I care, but since you have no principles of your own, don't do anything that'll ruin our rep. Ah. Uh, standing in front of my desk is Shinji Mato. He's been a friend of mine since middle school. His last name is Mato, and he's Sakura's older brother. He's one year older than her. Yo, things at the Kyudo Club going well, Shinji? Of course. There's no point telling an outsider like you, but the club's nice and peaceful now that there's one less member trying to hog all the attention. We're definitely going to make waves for the next tournament. Is that so? I guess Mitsuzuri is working real hard. Huh? What the hell are you talking about? I'm the only reason the Kyudo Club is setting records. You've been an outsider for a long time, so stop acting like you know it all, or you're going to embarrass yourself. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Besides, I'm not involved with the club, so I really wouldn't, I won't really concern myself with it that much. I put my bag on my desk and pull my chair back. What's that supposed to mean? Are you saying my Kyudo Club's boring to you? Get the fuck on somewhere! Damn, you pissing me off! I'm not saying that. Just that I'm not involved in it. Just saying I'm not involved. I'm not part of the damn club no more. So it's not right for me to just drop into the shit. If there's anything you need, let me know. I'll help you fuck. Like, I'm not going to help you fuck. But look, I remember you weren't good at fixing the shrink and bows. Yeah, thanks. I'll give you a call if there are ever chores to be done. Nigga, kill your... We, I'm gonna beat the shit out of you, bro. You about pissing me off. So I doubt that'll ever happen. Well, that's good. A captain who leaves busy work behind wouldn't be much of a captain. Just try not to trouble Miss Fujimura. She's terrifying if she gets mad. Mind your business. Just remember you're not a member of the club anymore. So don't go near the dojo. He's mad because I'm fucking his sister. He mad because I'm fucking his sister. 
I got one more hoe than he'll ever get, and that hoe is his sister. Kill yourself, pussy. But that's not nice. I shouldn't have caught Sakura a hoe. She's a sweetheart. She's a sweetheart. There's a clear, distinct difference between hoes and women. Remember that, guys. Remember that. Women are not hoes. Hoes are not women. A bitch is a bitch. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just like that, Shinji heads off to his seat. All self-important bluster as ever. He does seem moodier than usual. Unbelievable. How can he talk to you like that? He was the one who kicked you out. Oh, he said, were you there the whole time? What do you mean? How can you be so cold to me when I was listening attentively to a conversation out of concern for my friend? Huh? What, is concern, what, what does concern have to do with it? I haven't done anything worth worrying about. Fool. Of course I'm concerned. You have a short fuse. Now granted, if you punch Shinji, that would have gotten you some applause. But it probably wouldn't make the girls happy. It wouldn't be right for me to put my friend in such an unpleasant situation. I get it. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Issei. But I don't think that would ever happen. But I appreciate the concern. I would have punched his ass. Good. As long as you understand. But I was surprised. You usually get mad at the drop of a hat. But you're pretty tolerant with Mata. Yeah, Shinji's been like that for as long as I've known him. You get used to it. Guess that's how it is. It is. Now come on. Go back to your desk if you're satisfied. It's almost time for Miss Fujimura to dash in. More like floating. The bell to start homeroom rings. Normally the homeroom teacher comes into the classroom five minutes before, but our teacher is not fucking typical. Homeroom for class 2C typically starts one minute after the starting bell, in other words. I'm late, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late! Homeroom starts with the sounds of Fuji Nei, with the sounds of Fuji Nei shouts and hurried footsteps. Damn! Okay, I made it! Good morning, Gavrinyan! Damn! Fujine tumbles and I hear some unnatural sound. She's dead! Contrary to the hectic sounds of a few seconds later, the classroom is now dead silent. The mood shifts sharply. It's no wonder Fujine is called the human roller coaster. But honestly, the way she fell didn't seem like a laughing matter. Fujine hit her head against the podium and she's still lying on the floor. Seeing her lying there face down and unmoving as everyone's imagining the worst. Hey, someone up front, wake her up. No, I don't want to. She'll probably, like, bite me or something if I get too close. She's not a mimic. Miss Fujimura wouldn't do that. Well, why don't you wake her up then? Pass, I hate stuff like this. I don't like it either. You were gonna make a girl do it? The boy should step up and take control. Shut the fuck up! Somebody just do it! The students in the front row hard to get rowdy. Those of us sitting in the middle rows can't see what's going on. So we all stand up to get a look. Hey, she's not moving. Does she faint? Someone brings up the obvious. But the problem is, how do we get her to the infirmary? Or I like comrades in arms after dealing after our time dealing with Fujine. Probably nobody's thrilled by the idea of taking the teacher to the infirmary. Are you okay? A brave girl approaches. Fujine isn't moving. The class grows more concerned. That didn't look good. Her head literally slammed into the corner of the podium. That didn't hurt. She really is invincible. Nigga, she could be bleeding to death right now. Go get her to the fucking infirmary. Are y'all stupid? Y'all over here making jokes. The bitch could be dead. Maybe we could recruit her to the baseball team. More like a threat. The moment the tiger... Man, fuck no. Shut the fuck up. She, yeah, she's not responding. Do something. She could be dying right now and y'all joking and shit. Hey, you're right next to her. Wake her up. If she's dead, I'll be as good as dead too. This could get worse if we leave her. 
Oh my goodness, last resort. Everyone's on the same page, except Shinji and I. We keep quiet because the two of us dared not to be a part of what's about to happen. It comes out a whisper, even with so many kids speaking in unison. The word tiger is especially inaudible, and yet, Fujinate's previously motionless body reacts. Oh shit, she moved! This might be working, everyone. Keep going, it's the punishment of the tiger. Everyone's be on edge since midterm tests are approaching. It's a terrible idea on their part, but some students start to wave their arms and chant Fujinate's nickname. Wake up, tiger, it's the morning. You need to tiger up. Don't give in, tiger. Stand up, tiger. Come on, wake up. Time to wake the sleeping tiger. Tiger! T I G E R! Don't call me Tiger! Like a sudden bolt of lightning striking, Fujine stands valiantly as if to the fall hardly scratched her. Huh? What are you all doing? You guys should have get out of your seats during homeroom. Come on, get back to your seats and we'll begin. Fujine, back to her normal self, stands at the podium. It appears she recalled nothing between the time she jumped into the classroom and the time she woke up. Hey, Tiger doesn't remember anything. Sweet, we're lucky this morning. I don't know if you can call this lucky, honestly. The students shuffle back into back to their desks. Huh? Did someone just mock me? No, absolutely not. Must be imagination. Really? Then okay. We're gonna start morning homeroom, so everyone listen up. Fujine casually starts homeroom. She always goes on digressions between announcements, so it goes slowly. Which is why everyone should go home at an appropriate hour. The gate closes at 6, so everyone doing club activities shouldn't stay any longer than necessary. But 6 is so early, Taiga. Don't the athletic clubs get an exception? They will not. And Goto, you better call me Miss Fujimura. The next time you call me by my first name, I'll get mad, okay? Yes, ma'am. I'll be careful next time. Goto sits back down. He doesn't seem particularly remorseful. Too easy. When Fujimura gets mad, she does get mad. Doesn't matter if it's with a teacher or a student. And that is as close to a serious warning as she's ever going to give. But Goto doesn't realize it. That's it for today's homeroom announcements. I'll see you all at third period English class. Fujine waves and leaves. So that was Taiga Fujimura. So that was Taiga Fujimura, the teacher of, of room 2C. Her nickname, Tiger. That may seem like a joke, but it isn't. She got the nickname because it sounds like her name, Taiga. But Fujine hates it. According to her, it doesn't sound feminine. But she got the nickname because of how she acts. Who the fuck? This scary ass nigga again. Class will begin. Class duty. Lead the greeting. As Fujine exits the room, the first period teacher enters. Because Fujine takes up almost all of homeroom time, morning, mornings are all, always like this for our class. And so another day of classes in. There are many types of students. Some immerse themselves in club activities. Some hurry home. Some hang out in the classroom after. Some hang out in the classroom after class for no particular reason. I don't really fit in any of those categories. Do you have a minute, Nimia? Pick it back up with what we did this morning. Do you have some more time? Well, it's not like I don't have any plans. It's not as if I don't have anything to do at all. The biggest reason I quit the Kudo Club in the first place was because I wanted to prioritize my part-time job. It's been five years since I started working part-time jobs to earn money from my, for living expenses on my own since after my old man died. When you do so many different jobs, there are some requests you just can't say no to. Today is one of them. I was asked to help restock some product for a bar since they wanted as many strong helping hands as they could get. Though I'm sure I don't have to go help, the bar's likely asking everyone as an excuse to gather some folks and hang out afterwards. There are two options. I should... 
Help out. The stuff from this morning is unfinished. I should at least finish what I started. Change your plans. You want me to finish what we started in the morning, right? Leave it to me. I'll finish all repairs before exams start. That'll be helpful. Let's go check on our patient in the art club. Sure thing. Oh, but make sure nobody's around. You can't concentrate when there's people around. Of course, I won't let anyone get in your way. Keeping up with Issei's brisk pace, I follow him out of the classroom. I made it. The sun has long since set by the time we step outside the building. School gate is already closed. It's 7 o'clock, way past the time they close the gates, but thanks to Issei's help, the two of us avoided trouble. You really helped me out today. I'll repay you for this, so don't hesitate to ask me if anything comes up. Sure. I don't think anything will come up, though. I didn't help it because I wanted something in return. And I don't think I would ask Issei for anything impossible. Honestly. You might have to reconsider being such a good guy all the time. Having you around is certainly helpful, but I can't stand when other people use you for their own ends. Helping people may be a good thing, but you should be more selective about who you help. You just do everything everyone asks. You think so? Am I really that much of a pushover? Mm-hmm. And that means heartless idiots are gonna use you as they wish. You're a busy man, so it wouldn't hurt for you to decline requests from time to time. I honestly can't tell, but I think Issei is concerned for me. Ever since middle school, I've always been told about how helpful I am since I never decline requests or ask anything in return. I guess Issei thinks that's unhealthy. But I'm only doing this because I want to. And I decline any requests I feel are impossible, so there's no issue for me. You really don't need to worry about this. I know myself and my limits. Besides, helping people is a good thing. Not the sort of thing the son of a temple should be telling anyone not to do. But you take it to an extreme. You're gonna burn yourself out. I'll keep your warning in mind. See you tomorrow at school. Uh-huh. See you tomorrow. Issei leaves looking dissatisfied. Issei lives in Ryudo Temple, located on top of a mountain, which means he, he and I have to go our separate ways. I walk through the dark, the still darkened town. It's about half past seven. There should still be people loud and about at this hour, but there's no signs of anyone around. All right. There was a crime committed in Miyama the other day. A burglar murdered someone, I think. Must be why there's no one around, why the school's curfew has been set to 6 o'clock. Gas leaks and burglars, huh? Do you like it's getting dangerous around here? No wonder people are avoiding walking around at night. It's probably not safe to let Sakura go home on her own anymore. Ujine might be fine, but Sakura's house is in a residential area on the other side of town. I guess I should walk her, huh? Can't quite believe what I'm seeing, I must be wrong. I sense a presence on the uphill path I was sure was empty. Whoever it is, they're standing still and look to be peering down at me. Oh, shit. It's, um... I don't want to... I, I don't... I mean, I know her name. Should I say it? I'm going to just... Look. If you're watching this and you've never seen Stay Night or Zero, I've never seen Stay Night. This is my first experience with Stay Night, but I've seen Zero, so I recognize her. But I'm not going to say nothing about, like, what characters did in Zero, if they appear in Zero. But if I recognize them, like, I'm going to say their name. You feel me? I, I don't I don't want to. It's uh, it, it's very difficult for me to dance around shit like that, you know? But it's Ilya. I, I, want, I'm a, I want to say it, Ilya. I unconsciously hold my breath. A girl with silvery hair smiles and walks down the path without making a sound. As she passes by, You better summon one soon or you'll die, big brother. Damn, bitch. What she says makes no sense. I climb up the hill and reach my house. 
The lights are already on, which means Sakura and Fujine are home. Imagine she's the one killing people. <laughs> the moment I step into the living room, I smell the, I smell the delicious aroma of dinner. Sakura and Fujine are both eating at the table. Tonight's meal is chicken stewed and cream sauce. And it's fuck you. Chicken stewed and cream sauce. And it's put Fujine in an especially good mood. Welcome home, senpai. Please excuse us for eating ahead of you. Thanks, and sorry for being late. I should have come home earlier. That's fine, you still made it in time. Please wait while I prepare your plate. Okay, thanks. I'll go wash up so you keep an eye on Fujine to make sure she doesn't eat my portion. Yes, I'll do that. I go to my room. It's a sparse room compared to the storehouse, but it's still decorated enough considering I don't have any particularly particular hobbies. So most of them are random things Fujine just left here. After I wash my hands and change, I head back to see my food on the table. Thank you for the meal. Please, dig in. I hope you like it. Sakura is humble as ever. Sakura's cooking skills have vastly improved over the past year. My cook is no match for her western foods. My Japanese dishes might be a little better. Neither of us are good at making Chinese dishes. I'm glad to know she's improving. But it's also a little depressing when the pupil surpasses the master. Mmm, really is delicious. The longer you cook chicken, the tougher the meat gets. Which is why you need to take the extra strip of grilling the chicken to a crisp seal to seal in the ju- to a crisp to seal in the juices and flavors. It requires exceptional skill, and it's something the clumsy Fujine would never be able to manage, dumb bitch. No offense to Fujine, cause she's a sweetheart. What do you think, senpai? I think the dish turned out quite well. No complaints. The cream sauce is perfect. My cooking can't hold a candle to your western dishes. Yep, yep. Ever since Sakura started cooking, all her meat dishes have gotten better. Fujine has been concentrating on her meal until now. Pipes up. You're in trouble, Shiro. A student should have stayed out so late at night. Ah oh, shit. She looked to be in good spirits at the Sakura's meal, but the moment she sees my face, her mood turns sour. I bet you were helping someone again. That's fine, but you really should be coming home early for now. Don't you remember my homeroom announcement about how it's not been safe lately? I was speaking directly to you, Shiro. You really don't need to make a homeroom announcement for something you can just tell me at home. You wouldn't listen if I told you here, though. You're more likely to listen if I tell you at school. That seems like an abuse of authority, or at least missing business with private matters. Nope! Is it just what I have to do to make things sink in for Shiro? He always gets a short end of the stick because he's busy helping everyone. That idiot should come straight home once in a while and relax a bit. Who are you calling an idiot? What's wrong with helping people? I'm not losing out on anything as long as someone benefits from my help. You're starting to sound like Kirisugu. And that mindset has your big sister worried, Shiro. Seeing Fujine eating so heartily makes me wonder what exactly she's worried about. Miss Fujimura, just from that conversation, are you saying Senpai's always been like this? Yep, always. He's a type who would lend a helping hand whenever there's someone in need. It's not its not that he meddles in things, but he's always been a bit precautious. Need to hurry up and finish lane so I can start back on Monogatari. Oh, yep, oh, okay. Fujine grins menacingly. Fujine, I'm gonna get mad if you say anything you shouldn't. You shouldn't ask a silly question, Sakura. I glare at the two. Fujine clicks her tongue in disapproval. But Miss Fujimura, please continue. Oh, she she like I don't give a fuck, nigga. I want to hear. Sakura presses on like an attentive student. Then let me explain. You see, Shiro just can't help himself when he sees someone in need. It's like helping the weakest of doing the strong. When he was younger, he wrote an essay that he that said he wanted to be a hero of justice. 
This nigga here. Oh, uh, she on his ass. Quit bringing up the past, Fujine. I can't really jump in though because it's true. Besides, becoming a hero of justice is still my goal. Wow, you were a really wonderful child, senpai. Yeah, it was astonishing. He would swoop in to rescue a little girl from getting bullied by a boy twice her age. And he tried his hardest at doing housework because Kirisuga was such a slob at home. He was so cute and innocent back then. I'm not sure how he got to be the stubborn, disobedient boy he is today. That's on you, Fujine. That's what happens with children when they have bad role models. And you should want to say something to that. And if you want to say something to that, try making an entire meal all on your own. Fujine is shocked. I thought she would just lower her head and repent, but... Big sister is so sad. Sakura, third, please! She holds out her rice bowl asking for a third helping of dinner. That fuck. We relax after dinner and it's almost 9 o'clock. Well, what should I do? It's still some time before my evening training. Guess I'll... Walk Sakura home! What? Is this even a question? You need to walk Sakura home! Like, what are you gonna- like, bro, you just talking about how this freaking murderer is running about. You need to make sure she get home safe. I haven't thanked Sakura for cooking dinner yet, so I'll talk to Sakura. It's getting late, so I should walk her home. Sakura just finished cleaning up, so she's in the living room getting ready to go home. Oh, Senpai, I thought you were taking your bath. I'll take my bath later after I walk you home. You're going to walk me home? Yeah, it's been dangerous at night lately, so I'll walk you home. Your house is a pretty long walk, so at least let me do this, since you go out of your way to come here. Sakura purses her lips awkwardly. Did I say something wrong? I'm sorry. I appreciate your concern, but you should rest. I know my way home from here and I should be fine alone. Maybe so, but it really hasn't been safe lately. I'll walk you home at night for a while. But, well, it'll cause trouble for you if my brother sees you. Ah, shit, yeah, I forgot. Sakura's older brother Shinji doesn't really like Sakura coming over to my place. He can't say much because Sakura says she goes to Fujine's house, but me taking her home might cause problems. I don't care if Shinji accuses me of something I didn't actually do, but I don't want him taking it out on Sakura. It wouldn't be a problem if I only walked you halfway, right? There's no way we'll see Shinji at the intersection. Sakura's uncomfortably silent. Knowing Sakura, she probably couldn't even lie about the fact that I walked her home. Hey, then how about... Want me to walk her home? An English teacher wearing tiger stripes suddenly pokes her head to the door. That really doesn't fix anything. My concern is that a girl's walking alone at night, so adding another girl would be... Wait a minute. Calling Fujine a girl might be a bit of a mis misnomer. There's a reason Fujine is a teacher in charge of the Kudo Club. She was trained by old man Fujimura in Kendo, and her fifth rank designation makes her deadly, literally and figuratively. I guess it wouldn't be a problem if you went Fujine. I bet you could beat the crap out of any perverts who might try to strike. Of course I can. And that's why walking Sakura home is not a problem. You good with that, Sakura? Yes, as long as it's with you. That settles it. Let's get along. Let's get going. I was just thinking I should go home too. Fujine takes Sakura's hand and starts to leave. Oh, hold on, Sakura. What is it, senpai? Dinner was good, thank you. Of course. As long as you don't mind, I'll keep working on my cooking, senpai. Senpai, be Sakura beams and leaves the living room. I can tell my cheeks are burning red. Honestly, Sakura takes me by surprise a lot lately. 
it's perplexing. Time sure flies. Not so long ago, she was just my friend's little sister. Now I find sometimes I can't quite look away from her. It's so pathetic. I've always thought of soccer as being like family, but I can't seem to readily accept this change. And that is how my day ends. Just before midnight, Shiro Emiya must perform the daily routine of utilizing magecraft. I cross my legs, take my position, and regulate my breathing. I try to empty my mind. I ignore everything around me and focus to fo and turn my focus inward. I mutter the familiar incantation, as if putting myself in a spell. No, this is like a hypnosis. With no magic crest and no magical knowledge, the incantation I mutter is really just a way to focus myself and change my body. Typically, humans do not humans do not have any lines which allow magical energy to pass through their body. To temporarily change my body to create a pseudo version of the lines, I need to concentrate and unify my entire physical and nervous systems. Magecraft is a battle with yourself. For example, I insert a burning steel rod into my backbone. The steel rod itself is one and only is, is the one and only magic circuit I can prepare for myself. By passing this deep, by passing this deep within my body and connecting it to my other nerves, I can finally be a mage. This is not a metaphor, and if you look closely, a series of metal rods which cannot normally be seen or touched pierce my backbone. I'm a magician. Hiritsugu Emiya was a mage. He was a true mage who disciplined himself in a wide variety of mystics, plumbed the deeper secrets of the world in his workings, and even performed miracles. As a young child, I admired Hiritsugu and begged him to teach me magecraft. Well, you can't just become a mage. You have to be born with talent and inherit a tremendous amount of knowledge. I obviously never had that inborn talent and Kiritsugu never imparted any knowledge about magecraft to me. I was told it wasn't necessary for me, something like that. I still don't understand what he meant by that, but it didn't matter to me as a child. I always thought learning magecraft would bring me much that much closer to being like Kiritsugu. I was blessed neither with talent that is, I was blessed neither with talent, that is, an abundance of magic circuits within me, nor was generations of magecraft knowledge handed down to me. The magecraft Kirisuga possessed, the magic crest passed down from the Emiya family, and only be passed on to a blood relative. A magic crest, which is proof of one as a mage, rejects any not blood related. As an adopted son, I cannot receive the Emiya family crest. Then again, because I honestly don't have any idea what the hell a magic crest even is. It doesn't matter much whether I have one or not. It's just a matter of gaining the ability. If I want to be a mage, I just have to learn magecraft that suits the traits I do have. Magecraft is, take it to its extreme, a skill supposedly meant to release magical energy. You could say that magical energy is a life force. Magical energy is separated into two, into two sources. Mana, which comes from the world's atmosphere, and Ode which is created within living creatures. Obviously, mana, which comes from the world itself, is superior to Od. The sheer power of the world's mana supply is not even comparable to Od one human can create. No matter what form it takes, magecraft utilizing mana will always surpass anything created from an individual's Od. So a powerful mage is one who excels at drawing magical energy from the world. It's a lot like an info- Fuck! It's a lot like a filtration. Po, bark. It's a lot like a filtration system. A mage will use their own body circuits to draw in mana from outside and convert it into something usable. Mages call the circuits they use to accomplish this magic circuits. This is the inborn talent part. The number of magic circuits one has is determined at the moment of birth. Typically, humans have hardly any magic circuits. They're normally quite rare. That's why mages will spend generations trying to ensure their descendants have a body more suitable for magic. Some families even go as far as to practice selective breeding in order to increase the number of magic circuits in their children. Since I was raised in a normal family, I never had a chance of having much in a way having birth in a way of magic circuits. That left me with only one option. According to Kiritsugu, everyone is well suited to a specific form of magecraft. 
He also said something about drawing out magical energy based on the person's origin, but I never quite understood that part. What I do understand is that even someone like me can use at least one form of magecraft. If I can do that, then maybe I can be like Kiritsugu. And that's why I've only learned this one magecraft. That was eight years ago. After a lot of thought, Kiritsugu took me on as his disciple, though he never seemed happy about it. Listen, Shiro. Learning magecraft means leaving behind common sense. You die when the end comes for you, and you kill when you must. Life, life isn't at its core what we do, death is. Magecraft is walking the path of self-destruction. I guess I knew no fear as a child. Kiritsuku smiled bitterly, placing a hand atop my head as I nodded enthusiastically. What I'm about to teach you is the sort of thing that could cause conflict. So you should never use it in front of anyone, and you should never forget your training, because it's difficult. Then again, you don't really need to follow it either. The most important thing is that you always remember that maid's crap is to be used for others and not for yourself. And that would make you simply a user of maid's crap rather than a mage. I guess Kirisugu didn't want me to be a mage. I didn't care about that. I admired Kirisugu, not mages. As long as I could become the sort of person that helps others, like Kirisugu, on that day of fire and nightmare, I got distracted. I feel the uncomfortable sensation of the iron rod in my backbone moving where it shouldn't. Ugh, it hurts. Losing control of my breathing now would be fatal. The pseudo magic circuits would overwhelm my body and shred it to pieces, and that would be the end of me. Shiro Emiya would simply be a novice who died because he failed at an elementary step. Go ahead. <sighs> I grit my teeth and try to recover my connection. After pain like walking through a storm of needles, the iron rod finally sinks deep within my body and fuses with me. I've been working on this for a little over an hour. And after all that time, I'm finally able to create one pseudo circuit. A circuit capable of creating magical energy using my own self. Basic structure analyzed. All that's left is to, the, uh, is to allow the magical energy to flow naturally. Shiro Emiya is no mage. He is just a user of magecraft, who can only create magical energy within his body and channel it into objects. And that's why I can only do one thing with this magecraft, which is... Composition Analyze. Enhancing Objects. It's just strengthening magecraft. Why apprehend an object's structure and channel magical energy to temporarily reinforce its abilities. Basic structure alter. I hold a broken pipe. I pass magical energy through it to ex execute the most basic magecraft to enhance its durability. Passing magical energy into something other than yourself is like mixing poison. My blood is a far cry from the blood of the iron pipe, forcing uh, an entirely different sort of blood through an object may well destroy it rather than enhance it. To prevent that from happening, I need to properly understand an object's structure and pass magical energy into it between the small vacant spaces. Composition reinforce. This may be easy for a skilled mage, but since I have a hard time generating magical energy in the first place, even a task like this is as difficult as shooting an arrow and hitting a target several hundred meters from you. A typical archery target is 28 meters away, so it goes without saying how hard it would be to hit a target at 10 times that distance. My body temperature suddenly plummets. The fiery pillar passing through my backbone disappears and my lungs seize in desperate need of oxygen. My back arches in an effort to keep me from passing out. Ah, damn, I failed again. The iron pipe is unchanged. The magical energy I passed through it appears to have dispersed. Damn. Adding to something that already has a set form is hard. What I'm attempting to do is like adding an extra brushwork to a completed work of art. Adding something extra to a completed object raises the risk of compromising the object's integrity. The paintbrush, hoping to improve, may actually devalue the work instead. Which is why, despite its simplicity, Strengthening magecraft is so difficult. 
Strengthening Magecraft is so difficult. Fuck. Strengthening Magecraft is so difficult, not many mages willingly use it. And it's not that I chose this, but it's really all I can do. It would be much easier if I could make something from shapeless clay, but a substitute that just recreates its form and is all, is all showing no substance, which explains all the junk around. Whenever I fail at strengthening Magecraft, I try to make substitute objects to practice and calm down on, but they all end up empty. I can visualize the structure of an object easily. I can recreate something very similar, but it's hollow. Obviously doesn't function as well. I wipe the sweat off my brow. I realize I'm absolutely dripping with sweat. If this is as bad as it got, I should consider myself lucky. What happened the earlier was really bad. Had I taken a second longer to recover, my internal organs would be probably mushed by now. If only pushing myself to the brink of death helped me improve, there'd be some hope here. But nothing comes that easily. At the same time, fear of death will stand in the way of improving my magecraft. Learning magecraft means courting death at every turn. Even rudimentary, everyday magecraft can spin wildly out of control from a single mistake ending the caster's life. The very, thing a, the very first thing a mage must do is resolve to accept death. Hirisugo always looked sad whenever he brought that up. Maybe it was his way of saying he didn't want me getting into any of this. Saving one person means not saving someone else. Being a hero of justice means you need to be an extremely egocentric person. That was always his line. Hirisugo always said something about something, always said that whenever I mentioned wanting to be like him. I still don't know what he meant by that. All I'm certain of is that I want to save people, to be a hero of justice like Hirisugo Emiya. But I can't even manage the basics. Such an idiot for letting myself get distracted at the most crucial moment. It's not enough for me to just grasp the object's structure visually. A skilled mage would be able to focus on the crucial area, only focus only on the crucial areas and efficiently channel magical energy. My dream is to become a hero of justice. I remember what Fujinae mentioned at dinner. I never really thought of that goal as embarrassing or impossible. That Shiro Emiya will, ex will ex succeed Kiritsugu Emiya has already been decided. That's why I've been doing everything I can despite how sorely I lack in experience. I don't know exactly what it means to be a hero of justice, but because I don't know, I've trained myself to the best of my abilities in hopes that I'll be useful to somebody. I've been taking my eye off that goal these past five years, but when everything things go wrong like this, I start to have doubts. Oh, I just don't get it, old man. What the hell do I have to do to be a hero of justice? I look up at the sky through the window. It's not just about being good for someone out of the blue. Saving someone and being a hero of justice are two different things. I know that. But what do I have to do to differentiate them? I've yet to understand the crucial concept for these past five years. That's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoy, like, subscribe, leave a comment. I'll read them all, tap into the next one. I know that it has different um stories or routes right which does it like it'll tell me when i'm locked into one won't it somebody told me that it says fate but can that change actually i'm gonna ask somebody right quick oh okay 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 so your decisions don't decide what route you're doing okay i got it i got it all right, so, cause I need to make thumbnails, all right? So I'm like, I don't want to put fate route in the thumbnail and then it turns out to be freaking unlimited blade work, you know? So that's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoyed, like, subscribe, leave a comment. I read them all, tap into the next one. I'm really enjoying this game. Y'all know, uh, how long have I been recording? Dang, almost two hours. This game's had me locked in for two hours. Almost two hours. Y'all know, bro, once I hit that one hour point, I get so tired of reading. 
I get so tired of being behind the dang whatchamacallit, right? But hey man, look, this is this is keeping me locked in. I'm liking it. Uh I'm really interested to see how things go down. Actually, I think I might be tripping, but I think this is where I left off in the anime. Or maybe it was the next time we see Ilya. It's either right here or the very next time we see Ilya. One of those two. It's one of those two. I don't remember if Shira had summoned Saber or not. When I by the time I had stopped by the time I left off. But that was day one of the of um fate. Peace out, I love y'all tapping.